The new Ryzen 3 chips are here, which means it's time to build a budget gaming PC. Today, at for $750. Not only am I going to run through the parts I selected, I'm going to show you how to put it together, including all the tricky cabling, and then boot it up to see not only how it looks, but also how it performs. So without any further ado, let's dive into it. Are you ready? I'm going to kick off proceedings as always with our motherboard, CPU and RAM. Now the motherboard here is MSI's B450M Pro VDH Max. While there are new B550 boards coming soon with extra features and stuff, I found this board worked out of the box with the new Ryzen 3 chips. No need for a BIOS update. Into the motherboard I'm going to install this, our CPU, and this is the AMD Ryzen 3 3300X. With a base clock of 3.8 boosting up to 4.3 gigahertz, as well as having four cores and eight threads, it's a great option for any budget build in 2020. AMD also kindly sent this over, which is why it's not in its retail packaging in time for the launch. So big shout out to them. Installing your CPU, into the motherboard is super duper easy. Grip the CPU by the sides as not to touch at the delicate pins. And with your motherboard, pull up the retention arm like so. Find the little golden triangle on the corner of your CPU, just there, and line that up with the triangle on the corner of your motherboard socket. Simply slot it into place and it should sit flush. There's no need to force it or ram it in. It's gonna go in perfectly. Then pop the arm down. This really is that simple. We're going to install our CPU cooler next up. This comes included uh, with our AMD CPU and normally has pre-applied thermal paste. But because I've used this before, I just need to pop on a little bit of my own. Then it's simply a case of lining up these four screws with the corresponding four holes on your motherboard and then screw it in corner by corner. With it screwed in, you then take the four pin fan cable and pop it into our CPU fan header on the motherboard like so. The final thing to pop in our motherboard for now is our RAM or our memory. This is from Kingston and it's their HyperX Fury RGB. It's some of the best value RGB RAM on the market and I think RGB memory just adds a little something to your system. We're going to install this by pulling back the second and fourth dim slot clips, then find the notch. Oops, then find the notch on your RAM dim here and align it with the notch on your dim socket. And then it's a simple case of sliding it in and clipping it in from each side. It's a super duper easy process. The final thing to pop on our motherboard before we move it into the case is our storage. I opted for an M.2 SSD, which is gonna go in our motherboard here. And this is from Kingston. It's their A2000. It's got 500 gigabytes of capacity, though one terabyte models are also available. Now I've just gotta figure out how to get in this. Yes, there we go. To install your SSD, navigate to the M.2 slot and here you'll find a standoff with a screw pre-installed. We're gonna take this screw out and we're gonna use this in a second to fasten the drive down. Check that the standoff is in the correct location to line up with the end of your drive. And just like so, we're sorted. With the motherboard over to one side, I've grabbed our case, and this is from Aerocool. It's their Rift chassis, and it's a really great budget case with a bit of RGB at the front. Uh, I'd recommend with any case, you take off both the side panels, front and rear. This is gonna allow us to work a lot more easily in the case. When you buy any brand new case, you're gonna find a bunch of cables inside. These are your front panel USB kind of cables, which I'm gonna show you how to do in a minute. And then you'll also find a box or a bag of included accessories. This bag is really important because it includes some cable ties for your cable management, but also um, some motherboard standoffs and motherboard installation screws. With the case laid down flat, you'll see we've got four gold motherboard standoffs pre-installed. That's what our motherboard screws into. We need to make sure that these first line up with the holes on our board. So in this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then add any that might be missing. And that's where this little bag comes in. And then finally, before screwing our motherboard in, take your IO shield from your motherboard box. And this clips into the rear of the case. 
And then all you've got to do is screw your motherboard in. I find it's easier to start with the standoff right in the middle. With our motherboard in, let's sort out some of these cables while it's still nice and easy. The first thing I'm going to do is take our fan cable from this fan at the rear and simply install it into our system fan header on our motherboard and we'll tidy that cable away a little bit later. But then we need to grab this bunch of cables and feed them through the back of the case first. We're then gonna deal with them one by one. First is our USB 3 cable. We're gonna thread that through there and then plug it into the notched port on our motherboard. Next is our HD audio and it says on it HD audio and that goes to the bottom right corner and plugs in just like so to this HD audio connector. Next up is our USB 2.0 connector and we're gonna pop this next to our USB 3 connector. One of the pins is missing like with HD audio, so we'll only go in at one way. Finally, we're gonna pop through our front panel connectors. And you'll see here, I've popped a diagram on your screen now uh, while you follow along and see exactly where they go. If you plug these in the wrong way, don't worry. The system just won't turn on. It won't break, nothing will set on fire. You'll just have to go through and readjust them. And then with a little bit of just literally tucking the cables with your hand, we've got a nice tidy rear panel. We're gonna now install our power supply before getting onto the GPU, which I know a lot of you are gonna be excited for. This power supply is perhaps a tiny bit overkill for this build but I think the power supply is one area where it never hurts to spend a little bit more money. This is a pretty modest 650 watt unit from Cooler Master but it's 80 plus gold certified meaning it's super efficient and has a bit of upgradability. To install our power supply we first need to decide which cables to use. First is the big one the 24 pin motherboard power cable. We also need to grab one of these which has a bunch of SATA connectors on the end which powers up hard drives, two and a half inch SSDs and the RGB case lighting. Next up is this one which goes from an eight pin to two six plus two pin connectors that's our graphics card power cable and then finally this one here which goes from eight pins to four plus four pins and that's going to power our motherboard's CPU connector. Make sure you kind of keep hold of the other ones just in case for future upgrades and stuff uh, but this combo is going to cover you for a little while. This next bit might sound super silly but then it's a case of plugging the cubes that fit into uh, their corresponding connectors because they're all different sizes so it's pretty difficult to cock it up there. Then we're going to spin our case around and we're going to slide our power supply fan facing downwards into the back of the case. With the power supply in, I'm then going to run the cables into the right places. Our CPU connector goes up top here. Our motherboard cable comes to the, uh, the side of our motherboard just there. And finally, our GPU cable is going to run through this gap here, ready for our graphics card to be installed. Talking of the graphics card, I opted to go for the Gigabyte GTX 1660 Super. It's a great value card for 1080p and a bit of 1440p gaming, and it's gonna work perfectly for today's build. Installing a graphics card's easy. We're gonna push back the tab on our PCIe slot and just provisionally line it up to see which of our slot covers at the rear of the case need removing. Doing so is pretty easy. We're gonna remove the screws from the back here, which in turn allows us to get the top slot out. And then the second one, you kind of just kind of wiggle it and it comes out. <laughs> Way. And just like so, that is super, super simple. Use the same, Use the same screws we removed a moment ago to secure it into place and pop the cover back on. Yes, 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 yes. And then all that's left to do is install our final power cable. This one here is gonna juice up our GPU and like with our power supply cables from before, clips in just like so. Okay then, all that's left to do now is we're gonna screw the side panels on and then boot it up to see how it looks and performs. Roll the montage. Now that you've seen how to put this system together and what parts I picked and why, let's take a dive and see just how well it performs. Before that though, make sure to get subscribed if you aren't already. I'm going to be running through the most popular games, but first I wanted to quickly run Cinebench. 
this gives us a really good idea of how well these new uh, budget Ryzen CPUs perform. And while the numbers are not going to be off the charts, these are budget CPUs, they are competing with or beating out i7s from previous generations, which means a bit of 1080p video editing in Resolve or Premiere Pro is going to be possible on this machine. The first game on the list today though is Apex Legends, 1080p high settings we're seeing in the region of 120 frames per second. I ran all the games today at 1080p, though a bit of 1440p with lower settings is possible, and tried to stick to high settings while achieving in excess of 60fps. It's a similar story in Battlefield 5, as I said 1080p high settings around 90 frames per second. While it did allow me to enable ray tracing, I'm not going to on this machine. Because we're not using an RTX GPU, it's going to kind of disproportionately impact your performance and not really necessary on a budget machine. I do love Battlefield 5. I think the graphics are incredible, uh, but it's definitely not as good as Apex Legends or Call of Duty's Warzone. Talking of Call of Duty's Warzone, how convenient. That's the next game on my list today. 1080p, high settings, around 95, 97 FPS on average. Warzone is actually a pretty easy game to run, providing you don't use ray tracing, as with Battlefield 5, on the more budget-oriented machines. Something you can run though at ultimate settings on a budget-oriented machine is CSGO, and here our 1080p pretty much maxed out on the settings, uh, VSync turned off of course to keep our frame rate unlimited, around 250 FPS. That is bonkers. I mean, it's crazy the FPS could literally half and it would still be double at the, the refresh rate of most monitors that gamers are using. Forza Horizon 4 is my first racing title on today's list and at 1080p ultra settings, that was what it kind of pre-suggested, we're seeing 100 plus frames per second. I did run the inbuilt gaming benchmark in Forza Horizon 4 because it gives us a unified result. It gives us a result you can compare. You can go back to any of my previous builds and sort of pit these two against each other. Uh, the next game on my list today, my favourite game at the minute, I've, I mention it in every video, but it's true, Overwatch. Overwatch, 1080p, ultra settings, 130 frames per second. That is bonkers. Overwatch looks so good graphically, and even though the graphics are quite complex, there's quite a lot of dynamism to them, a bit of depth, you know, because the actual scene you're rendering in is much smaller than an open world game like Warzone, it performs very well indeed. Project Cars 2 is the penultimate, the one but last game that I tried out. Definitely easier to run, but a game that a lot of people uh, are still playing nowadays. 1080p high settings, we're seeing 75 to 80 frames per second. I've used the same track with the same Ford Mustang GT as I have in all my builds, so once again, feel free to go back and not only compare the frame rate, but also the visual quality, you know, the visual settings and how good the game looks overall. The final game on my list today is GTA 5, another game where I ran the inbuilt benchmark. It's really easy, comparable, and it impressed, I'll be honest with you. 1080p, high settings, we're seeing 70 to 100 FPS, and that's with some of the advanced scaling distances at really put up a notch, you know, so we're not we're not skimping on any settings while still getting a very, very playable gaming experience. A bit of 1440p, as I said, is possible if you're prepared to sacrifice either some visual settings or a bit of frame rate or a little bit of both, but 4K is not where this machine is oriented. Spend a bit more money if you want some super high res gaming. With that being said though, I think that just about wraps it up. If you did enjoy today's video, give it a big old like rating. Make sure to get subscribed by clicking the G on your screen now. And as always, we'll see you in the next Geekawatt video.